hidden in restricted archives, preserved for generations. Discover riches frozen in time. Each has untold value and a story to tell. I'm Shauna Sanford. Join me as we track down the experts and go behind the scenes and beyond the gates on the hunt for the treasures of LSU. Funding for this project was provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our first stop, Hill Memorial Library, where Elaine Smith, the head of Special Collections, is taking us behind the scenes for a rare glimpse of John James Audubon's masterpiece, The Birds of America. Well, I'm so excited about what we're going to see today. Me too. I'm excited to have you here. Let's go to the stats. Okay. Hidden amidst a 26-mile maze of shelving lies... The vault. The vault. Mm -hmm. The vault. There are only 134 complete sets of the first edition known to exist in the world. This uh, is beautiful. It is. It's a gorgeous thing. It is. And we haven't even opened it yet. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Which I can't wait to do. Elaine, this is such a great place to start our adventure looking at the great masterpiece of John Audubon. It's undoubtedly our greatest treasure among our printed books. Published by subscription from 1827 to 1838, The Birds of America remains an ornithological touchstone to this day. Consisting of hand-colored prints made from engraved plates, Audubon's monumental work is world-renowned for its scientific accuracy and remarkable artistry. 167 of the 435 pictures in Birds of America were drawn on Louisiana soil. Several of them are now extinct, but not forgotten, thanks to Audubon's legacy. Greatly inspired by Audubon's work, I had to meet his muse, so I tracked down Dr. Van Remsen, curator of birds at LSU's Museum of Natural Science. Dr. Remsen, tell me about this amazing collection. This is the George Lowry Gallery of Louisiana birds. There's one of every species that occurs in Louisiana here. Uh, but where we're going to go next is the research collection. That's where the real treasures are. The ninth largest bird collection in the world, it now ranks third among university-based collections, second only to Harvard and Michigan. That is a huge wing. Isn't that amazing? It is. Look at this. The and wingspan I think it's of, uh, just about as tall birds. as me. Uh -huh. I don't know who's this, this? Who's this bigger. It's going to be... <laughs> It's going to be a close call. As if coming face to face with a giant monkey-eating eagle wasn't enough, I was even more shocked when Dr. Remsen revealed that. The LSU Museum of Natural Science has the world's largest collection of bird DNA, 60 plus thousand samples. But perhaps most astonishing is just how much bird data LSU has amassed. I think we have more data on birds in this collection than any other collection in the world. This is, um, this is the Barbet family and in this family is a species of bird that was discovered by one of our staff research associates, Dan Lane. He knew it was a new species of bird the minute he saw it. I sat down with Dan, who revealed that his was a case of serious beginner's luck. Not only was it his first trip to Peru, but since he was recording bird sounds at the time, he happened to capture the whole thing on tape. First you hear some sounds that the bird is making. They're barely audible. This and then is you... the barbet that we're hearing? that really deep rumbling. Dan's fortuitous expedition was led by Dr. John O'Neill. Credited with discovering several new bird species of his own, Dr. O'Neill is also the bearer of our next treasure, one that's buried deep within the museum's archaeological and ethnographic collection storage. My guide, Dr. Rebecca Saunders, just might need a torch. And I feel like this is our Raiders of the Lost Ark moment, too. Yeah, <laughs> one of these boxes is going to start glowing. <laughs> Um, we have over a million artifacts and ethnographic objects. I have one of my favorite ethnographic objects out here on the table. This is the uh, chief ceremonial headdress. It was given to us by Dr. John O'Neill. He did a lot of bird research in the Amazon basin in the 60s and worked with tribes in bird collection. He became quite friendly with uh, many folks and the chief actually gave him this headdress. They're quite generous. Uh, and he held on to it until the 90s, and then he donated this and a number of other, uh, 30 other headdresses uh, made by the Kashinawa people. Oh, on the wonderful. Amazon Basin. This is so elaborate. And it's um, only the chiefs that can make such an elaborate headdress. In general, 
folks are supposed to make headdresses that are elegant in their simplicity, mm -hmm. like this one. This is a, another almost predominantly all macaw, uh, though these clipped feathers are vulture, I believe. Um, this may have been worn by a man to go courting, his potential lover. Lovely. Uh, the hat uh, gives him a little supernatural power. And, well, uh, what woman wouldn't want a man with such a beautiful headdress? If he headdress. can make a hat like that. In fact, it is only men that make these hats, right. and they consider that a good hat makes me radiant. But for the ladies, a designer dress is more likely to do the trick. And I'm meeting curator Pam Vinci at LSU's Textile and Costume Museum for some 19th century fashion tips. This is a very special piece in the Thomas Butler collection in the museum. Um, it's entirely hand sewn uh, and made from a very um, simple fabric, cotton muslin. It was a day dress dated at approximately 1817 and worn by Anne Madeline Ellis Butler. Uh, at the cottage plantation just north of St. Francisville, so also of Louisiana provenance. But what's so interesting about it are, is this unique fashion detail that you see here. There are three-dimensional puffs that seem to burst from these slits in the, in the base fabric. And this was a very important uh, fashion detail illustrated in French and English fashion plates of the period. Uh, so what this dress shows is that even in outlying uh, areas of the United States that uh, Americans were still anxious to recreate uh, European fashions. Well, this is absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing it to me. Oh, you're most welcome. A fashion statement like this should have a fitting place to be kept, and this next antique might have made a nice home for it. Curator Natalie Malt is about to take me on a behind-the-scenes tour for an exclusive look at some of LSU's finest works of art. The LSU Museum of Art has a collection of about 5,000 works, and we have 15 galleries to display all these, these works. Mm -hmm. One of the oldest pieces in our collection, and one of my favorites, is this Creole armoire. This piece was dated from um, 1800 to 1825, mm -hmm. and we know that because of the wood that was used. Um, the wood consists of mahogany, poplar, cedar, and walnut. That also helps us to say that it indeed was from this area of Louisiana. A true Louisiana piece. That's correct. So we have this very angular, very boxy shape mm -hmm. on these very delicate cabrio legs. Oh, this is beautiful. Well, and on the inside, you can see the drawer pulls um, they're original to the piece, which also makes it very unique and very rare. And you can notice the star in the middle. That's actually an admiral's star. So we know that this was originally commissioned for somebody who was a very wealthy admiral. Okay. And this would be a sign of prestige, a sign of wealth, right? It was. Most people wouldn't have been able to afford a piece like this. Most people would have put their linens in something like a small chest. Um, this here, though, would have been something that would have been commissioned by the admiral. Um, as a sign of prestige that he would have put on display within his house. Well, it's absolutely beautiful, a true Louisiana treasure. As are these next pieces. Handcrafted at Newcomb College in New Orleans, these distinctly original artwares are considered one of the most significant American potteries of the first half of the 20th century. And here we are, an example of Newcomb pottery. That's right. This is a beautiful example of the um, middle period of Newcomb pottery. And one of the most unusual things about Newcomb pottery is that it was actually thrown by a a man but decorated by a woman. This particular piece was decorated by two women, um, Irene Borden Keith and um, Mary Walcott Richardson, but it was um, thrown by Joseph Meyer. They just felt like men were supposed to throw the pottery, is that right? That's right, it was men's work. <laughs> and what can you tell us about the coloration that we're seeing, the irises, and even the clay? Well, besides it being just visually stunning, the colors on the pot were inspired by the colors you see in the Louisiana. The iris, too, is inspired by the um, fauna and foliage of Louisiana, much like the rest of the arts and crafts potters, um, very much inspired by what was around them. They took resources from their environment down to the clay, and it's um, supposed that clay from Lake Pontchartrain was used in the actual throwing of the pot. So a true Louisiana piece through and through. But as the arts and crafts era began coming to a close after the Great Depression, a new kind of art was emerging out in the country. Nestled in the heart of Baton Rouge is a 450-acre sanctuary donated by the Burden family. 
The Rural Life Museum boasts an extensive folk art collection, and Executive Director David Floyd is about to show me a few works by one of Louisiana's most acclaimed artists. Clementine Hunter was born to former slaves and spent much of her life working on plantations as a field worker and a housekeeper. Her unique art reflected plantation life and Natchitoches society as she experienced it. A powerful influence in her personal life, the church also played a prominent role in her work, illustrated in this painting called Baptizing. Well, the first two ladies and the ladies in the uh, baptizing in the, in the water are very large. Right. So apparently she admired them a lot, okay. so she made them bigger. Okay. There are paintings of church scenes in which the preacher is very small. Well, these were preachers she didn't care for. <laughs> <laughs> so she literally made you small. If she didn't like you. <laughs> if she didn't like you. So she really revealed a lot about herself and, and what she thought about what was going on around her. And what's great about it is a glimpse of rural life mm -hmm. in Natchitoches Parish. Mm -hmm. The Rural Life Museum interprets a working class life featuring the largest collection of 19th century material culture from Louisiana's rural past, including this uniquely American architectural gem called a dog trot house, built by the Neal family in 1863. The Neal family is an extraordinary family because they were free people of color that moved to central Louisiana on the outskirts of Rapides Parish in Gardner, Louisiana and built this house. It's just incredible. And this building was lived in, can you believe it, until 1976 by the granddaughter of Henry Neal who built the house. And Somebody was living in this until 1976. Absolutely. And in fact, it wasn't until 1965 that she had electricity. She had gotten <laughs> too old to chop wood. <laughs> After learning more about the Neal family, David takes me to the plantation section. In an effort to pay homage to the workers' way of life, Steel Burden set about acquiring a slave cabin. Instead, he fortuitously salvaged an entire complex of buildings from the Wellham Plantation in Convent, Louisiana, dating from 1830. They ended up finding these buildings in their entirety and moving them um, just in the nick of time and that they were about to be destroyed by bulldozers oh in order to expand gosh, the fields. That was just in the nick of time. <laughs> Absolutely. And what's so important is not only did they move them here, but they moved them um, as they had found them at Wellham Plantation. So geographically, they're in the correct um, location as they were in Wellham. This is the oldest slave cabin. It's a two-room uh, building, and imagine six to eight people living in each room. Can, can we take a closer Absolutely. look? Please come in. Six to eight people in this one room. It's about 12 foot by 12 foot, and it would have been wall-to-wall -wall mats, if you can imagine. They're made of corn shucks or uh, moss, but in the morning, you would have rolled up your mat, tied it off, put it in your spot that you've designated yours, claimed, mm -hmm. and then that gave you room to walk around, sweep, cook, on the uh, fireplace, your meals, and that type of thing. Wow, and how long uh, were people living in this sort of situation? Well, in this particular building, um, this the uh, plantation workers lived on Welland Plantation in this building up until the late 1950s and 1960s. 1960s, Absolutely. folks were living in this, Absolutely. In this cabin. Absolutely, pretty much as you see it. Wow. Accustomed to modern conveniences, it's hard to believe that many rural workers and families lived in conditions like these without electricity and plumbing until recent decades. Even harder to imagine is the day-to-day -day life of our 19th century ancestors. But a remarkable glass negative buried deep within a collection of Natchez plantation papers belonging to the Connor family gives us a stunning portrait. An archivist, Mark Martin from LSU Libraries, helps shed some light on this mysterious woman. Oh, we don't know anything about her. All we know is that she had her photograph taken in the Natchez area roughly, well, sometime in the 1870s or 80s. We know from that background that it was from the um, Norman studio. Beyond what the content of the image is, everything else is supposition. Um, chances are very good that she didn't have the money to pay for it herself. Mm -hmm. The Connors, which is in the collection, was their photograph. Mm -hmm. It's likely that they paid for it and that she had some relationship to them, but that's all supposition. There's no record of saying who did what or when or any of that. Given the photographic technology and social context of the day, this authentic professional image is very rare. So Mark, the negative itself is absolutely beautiful, but the print of the negative is just stunning. It is, it is indeed. The negative, you get the sense of what kind of strength this this subject had, um, 
her face, her hands, which were very, very strong. Mm -hmm. But when they're printed, uh, it's just, just beautiful. Yeah, very mysterious, very intriguing, a wonderful treasure. Thank you so much for sharing oh, it with welcome. me. You're welcome. Glad to do it. Art can frame history, offering a unique window into the past. And I'm meeting historian Dr. Paul Hoffman for a little perspective on our next treasure, an epic work painted by Jean Berkland, Sue Brown, Roy Henderson, and Ann Wolfock in the late 1930s. Dr. Hoffman, you're immediately struck by how beautiful these murals are as soon as you walk in the building. Yes, they are quite exceptional, aren't they? These were done by undergraduates as theses projects during their senior year in art. Uh, their instructor was a man named Conrad Aprizio, who was fairly well known as a muralist uh, in the 1930s. These are frescoes, so they're paint on wet plaster, which is the same technique that Michelangelo used when he painted the Sistine Chapel. A rare medium in the United States, these frescoes celebrate Louisiana's rich economic and cultural history, providing a lasting testament to the times. A few of the murals were painted over in the 1960s and over time became part of campus lore. Sue Brown's master's thesis was one of them, hidden for decades until it was rediscovered and resurrected by fresco restorer Cheryl Elise Grenier. Unveiled in 2001, it's still not wholly understood. Uh, the meaning of it is not entirely clear uh, in terms of what the figures are supposed to represent. So it's one of those mysteries on campus of which there are a number. And if you're interested, I'll show you another one, uh, which is the bronze artillery down by the uh, Military Science Building. Oh, I'd love to see those. And what is the mystery behind those cannons? The mystery is who actually gave them to LSU. So these are the cannon. Uh, the famous plate down at the bottom, which says they were donated by William Tecumseh Sherman, which is probably not true. There's the plaque. It says these cannon were cannons fired at Fort Sumter and presented to the university by General W.T. Sherman after the Civil War. None of that's true. Almost certainly none of it is true. And they didn't fire on Fort Sumter because they're field artillery and they didn't have the range. Uh, and it's, as far as I can discover in the, in the documentary record, uh, Sherman had nothing to do with them. But it makes for a good story. It makes for a great story. <laughs> Legend or not, these cannons are true treasures. Only nine of their kind still survive. So Dr. Hoffman, this is solid bronze, right? Yes, it is. And there's another bronze treasure, which also has a little mystery to it, that you might also like to go see. Oh, I'd love that? to, yes, let's go. Well, here we are. This is the Energy Coast and Environment Building. Uh, and these sculptures were, or were the work of James Sanborn, who is a nationally, internationally acclaimed artist. Sanborn's radiant sculpture is comprised of two bronze cylinders with water jet cut inscriptions reflecting environmental themes relating to energy. So there, there are six quotations on each panel. There are two panels, so there are 12 in all. Okay. Uh, seven, at least seven languages, maybe eight, but I'm, I'm not quite <laughs> sure about some of them. <laughs> I mean, I don't read Abyssinia, <laughs> among other things. Uh, so, but they all refer to either natural gas or oil or the discovery of a, of a natural seep of oil okay. in somewhere, some, some part of the world. From an ancient Chinese passage in 300 BC to Spanish passages into the 18th century, each provides unique insights concerning human interaction with the natural world. And I'm noticing that these letters are backwards. Why is that? Uh, that's a mystery which only comes to light at night. Oh, so that means I'm going to have to come back. Oh, absolutely. Well, absolutely. I, I think I can do that. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Hoffman, you. for showing Thank me you. these treasures. It's been a pleasure. Likewise. Upon nightfall, I made my way back and was astonished by the transformation. Darkness brings the sculpture to life, internal lights revealing its luminous message. Walking amidst the powerful passages inscribed over centuries and across continents, its brilliance is clear, but its meaning still remains somewhat elusive. Our next treasure, however, sheds a whole new light on a cryptic civilization, and LSU Libraries and Lane Smith is about to show me the description of Egypt. Here we have books from the Rare Book Collection, mm -hmm. and right up here are the books that we came to see. These are large books. They're very large, and I'm going to put you to work here. Okay, I'm ready to get to work. Take one end. Okay. 
and we'll carry this into the oh, McElhaney room where we can have a bit lady uh, here. Yes, indeed. As we carry it back into the library, Elaine begins to share the story behind this colossal work. In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte embarked on a colonial conquest of Egypt. For the first time in military history, the mission included an army of 160 scholars. Their objective? To draft the first comprehensive survey of Egypt ever undertaken. The result? A 20-volume, multidisciplinary masterpiece called The Description of Egypt. And so even though his military um, expedition was a complete failure, mm -hmm. um, the scholars came back and, and published then the findings, and that's what's in these volumes, are the images of e e Egypt that they took. So it was really an academic success. It was, it was, <laughs> and, and it set off a huge fashion for all things Egyptian that they called Egyptomania. Egyptomania, I love that, that yes. word, Egyptomania. Pretty, pretty amazing. With only 1,000 copies printed in the first edition, complete sets are exceedingly rare, and LSU is fortunate to have all of the plates and most of the text volumes in theirs. Library records show that this special collector's edition has belonged to the university since the 19th century and may have been a part of LSU Library's very first holdings, but little is known about its provenance. Well, it's striking to look at, and it's even more striking to know that it is this vibrant all these years later. It's yes. very vibrant. Absolutely. It's one of the few copies that was printed with the color actually being printed. Uh, most copies are uncolored, so it's particularly special so it's for even us more to rare. Have. While I've thoroughly enjoyed exploring a few of the many treasures tucked away at LSU Libraries, it's time to check out and head downtown. Back at the Museum of Art, the staff kindly grants me a rare look at their collections, many hidden away in secure storage. And curator Natalie Malt is about to divulge some little-known insights about a few of LSU's most intriguing works of art. This is a work by Diego Rivera um, titled Portrait of Caroline Wogan Durier. Painted at a dinner party in one sitting after much prodding by Durier's husband, Rivera depicted her in typical Mexican attire with eyes full of wonder. And perhaps this is his way of saying that um, Durier was not um, Mexican like himself, mm -hmm. but had these kind of Mexican sensibilities, much like, um, like a child experiencing something new. Though very dear friends, Rivera was quite reluctant to paint Durier's portrait, perhaps fearing that he might not be able to capture all the qualities he so admired about her. But she refused to paint his portrait for a very different reason. Um, Caroline Durier, although she admired um, Diego Rivera, she did not return the favor of painting a portrait of him because she said that he looked very much like a frog. <laughs> Durier's wit is exemplified in a very rare painting of a very real place in Mexico City. It's one of only 12 of her paintings that still survives. And they weren't destroyed in some great fire or some you know, act of God in, in that sense. Um, they were destroyed mainly by the artist herself who didn't feel like they represented who she was as an artist. So she actually got rid of her own work. She did. Um, I think this one survived because it is indicative of her um, the characteristics and the satire that she's known for. Um, it also really is quite rare because we also have a cartoon drawing that accompanies this painting. And this is the sketch right here. It is. In the early 1930s, Cafe Tupanamba hosted a virtual who's who of Mexican society. It was a place where bullfighters would have come and actresses, and here we see four um, diplomats. Um, it's a style that's very reminiscent of Diego Rivera that Caroline Durier would have borrowed from, where she is capturing the, um, you know, the character of these four men and really kind of poking fun of, of who they are in, within society. Though fascinated by Durier's work, there are a few more treasures I've just got to see. So Natalie's taking me upstairs for an exclusive, unobstructed view of our next treasure, Sitting Cat, a high glaze ceramic sculpted in 1948 by famed Shearwater Potter, Walter Anderson. 
Um, he was a very incredible artist who was very much inspired by especially animals mm -hmm. in and around Shearwater. Uh, especially did, cats, right? He did. <laughs> he did cats in all different positions. Seated cats, laying cats, you know, cats on their hind legs. Um, and even wrote a book about a cat. He did. He wrote a book called um, Robin, uh, Robinson, <laughs> a, um, a very pleasant history for an unusual cat. And it's a wonderful story about a cat that drinks some magical milk <laughs> and it gets these innate abilities to play music and goes on to play at Carnegie Hall. One reason this cat is so rare is that he bears a striking resemblance to Robinson. The other is far more ominous. So unfortunately, many of the buildings there at Shearwater were destroyed during Hurricane Katrina, right? They were, um, and not only were the buildings destroyed, but a lot of the original molds, so mold that would have been used to make a cat like this were also destroyed, making the LSU Museum of Art's seated cat even that much more of a treasure. You're so lucky to have it. Like great art, universities spark ideas, cultivate knowledge, and inspire. Though the artifacts we've seen are remarkable, it is their rich history and the people who keep it alive that are invaluable. And only the chief These are just a few of the many treasures to discover at LSU and throughout Louisiana. And if I've learned anything on this journey, it's that it's only just begun. Thanks for joining us and happy hunting. <laughs> Pretty amazing story about how you discovered the Scarlet Bandit. Bartlett. I okay. want to say Bartlett. Bart this is the LSU Museum of Natural Science DNA Analysis Slap. No way, I got to do this all over again. Okay. Right, take seven. Well, we have a, a quite a good collection here of archaeological. <laughs> For more information about this program, visit us online at lpb.org. Funding for this project was provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or visit us online at lpb.org. <laughs>